Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India All right, welcome to this. Uh, we have been talking about uh, interaction metrics, metrics that quantify the interaction in a multi inter, in a multi variable system. Interaction metrics. And last time we described what is known as the Niederlinsky index and by definition if I have a steady state open loop equation y is equal to k times u where k is the gain then the Niederlinsky index is defined as Niederlinsky index is equal to determinant of k divided by product of the di diagonal terms of the gain matrix k i i and what we said was that if the Niederlinsky index is less than 0 closed loop system is guaranteed integ integral unstable unstable so this is actually a tool for discarding input output pairings that would be unstable because of unfavorable interaction and we also said that for Niederlinsky index close to 1, close to 1, uh, this is at least for a 2 by 2 system, it means that the interaction, the steady state interaction is one way. Okay. So, Niederlinsky index close to 1 in some sense shows that the interaction is not as bad. Okay. All right. Now, Traditionally, we also have another interaction metric and that is called the relative gain or rather the relative gain array, relative gain array. Uh, how do you define the relative gain? relative gain lambda i j, where i refers to output subscript, j refers to input subscript, yeah, is by definition do y i do u j, all other inputs are constant divided by do y i by do u j all other outputs other than y i are held constant. Okay. Uh, if you to understand it in plain English, I mean what you are saying is if I look at the i j pair i refers to output, j refers to input. If I look at the i j pairing, then what I have is the definition of relative gain is what is the gain that this pairing sees with all other loops open all other loops open 
what that means is all other inputs are held constant all other inputs are held constant divided by what is the gain of this ijth pair with all other loops closed now because all other loops are closed what we have is all the other outputs other than y i are at their set points all right so the relative gain is the ratio of the gain for the ij pair with all other loops open divided uh, ver, uh, and all other loops closed okay so this is uh, the english interpretation of relative gain lambda ij is close to 1 what that means is whether the other loops are closed or not the ijth pair gain for lambda ij close to 1 k ij does not or depends very little does not depend on whether the other loops are closed or not on whether the other loops are closed or not the gain that i see k i j is in some sense independent of what is the state of the other loops whether they are closed or not so relative gains close to 1 imply let us just call it favorable interaction it does not imply no interaction, but that the interaction is relatively mild and therefore, we call it favorable interaction. Okay. Now, if I this is my row index and let this be my uh, column index, okay. I can fill up lambda 1 1 lambda 1 2 lambda 1 n okay. and so on so forth somewhere there will be a lambda i j and then I will have lambda n 1 lambda n 2 lambda this is called where I have calculated the relative gains of all possible input output pairings. I pair i with j, i can take so many values, j can pair so many take so many values for each of those when I calculate my relative gain and put it in terms of an array that is called a relative gain array. Okay. How do I calculate the relative gain array? Well, if you look at lambda i j is equal to do y i do u j at where all the other u's are held constant divided by do y i by do u j where all the other outputs are held constant which is the same as do y i by do u j u k times do u j over do y i all other outputs are held at their set points. Okay. Now, this is the open loop gain k i j, where my open loop steady state equation is y is equal to k times u. 
okay. Uh, what is this guy? How do I get this guy? Well, to get this guy, let me invert it and get u is equal to k inverse y. All right. Now, if all the y's are held constant, all the y's except y i are held constant. What that means is that all the terms in this guy, except the ith term, are zero. Okay. And when I do that, what I'll get is u will be equal to k inverse 0 0 the ith element is 1 the other elements are all 0 okay and therefore what i will get is the jth element because i must look at the change in the jth element uj will be equal to k inverse j comma i all right the matrix the 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 j ith element of the k inverse matrix will correspond to uj all right so what i get from this is that lambda ij is equal to k inverse this matrix its j ith element times the gain matrix times its ijth element and if I have to do it for all values of i and j, then what I get is my relative gain array R g a is equal to k inverse. Now, because the index is not i j, it is j i, therefore, I have to take a transpose uh, Hadamard product, how do I define Hadamard product uh, times k, the gain matrix. Let us see. This is element by element multiplication not matrix multiplication but element by element multiplication okay so this is how you calculate your relative gain array and once you've calculated your relative gain array you want to find out what is to be paired with what you look for terms that are close to one and then sort of say that the recommended pairing is let us say I look at a 3 by 3 relative gain array and I find that of all the elements 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So, this is i and this is j. What I find is that this element this element and this element are close to 1. Okay. Then what we say is you should be pairing this is what 2 output 2 this is y with input 1 output 1 with input 2 output 3 with input 3 this is the recommended pairing from the relative gain array. Okay. Uh, how do you calculate the relative gain array? I just told you calculate the inverse of the gain matrix, take its transpose and do element by element multiplication with the gain matrix that is a relative gain array. What should you avoid? Avoid pairings with negative relative gain. Why is that? Well, the neg a negative relative gain is saying that all other loops open all. See, if I look at the plain English definition of relative gain, it is the gain between the ijth pairing with all other loops open divided by the gain for the ijth pairing with all other loops closed now if this number is negative what that means is my controller is 
seeing well what that means let me give you an example if you increase steam you would express ex expect that the temperature on the tray of a distillation column should increase so gain should be positive open loop gain you expect to be positive but for some reason if the relative gain is negative what that means is depending on whether all loops are open or not so if all loops are closed uh, if all loops are open if you increase steam tray temperature increases on the other hand if all other loops are closed what you get is if you are increasing steam the tray temperature is decreasing that is what would cause the relative gain to be when you take the ratio you will get a net negative number right so that is what would cause the relative gain to be negative and what this means is that the process gain sign changes depending on whether the other loops are on or not okay so a direct acting controller must become a reverse acting controller and a reverse acting controller must become a direct acting controller depending on the status of the other loops and operators keep taking loops on or off you know and they will always sometimes the operator would like to intervene he will switch off a loop and take control action himself but if the other loop the gain sign has changed that loop would go unstable uh, unstable in the sense instead of incre increasing the steam you would keep on decreasing the steam and, and the steam valve will ultimately shut down or vice versa ok so this is something that is not desirable must be avoided so as a tool for rejecting I O pairings if you look at the relative gain array all I O pairings that have negative relative gain should not be implemented ok what should be implemented what are possible candidates for implementation are all relative all elements with all possible I O pairings with positive relative gains preferably as close as possible to 1 ok uh, while we have practical use in practice when you are supposed to figure out what should what input out output pairing should be implemented practical use would always be common sense get the input output pairing from common sense once you have that input output pairing from engineering common sense and what constitutes engineering common sense would constitute the rest of the course but once you have that input output pairing check Niederlinsky index check relative gain all right and if these are okay you are all right so these are actually confirmed in some sense confirmatory tools think tools that tools that confirm your engineering judgment that yes this is what I wanted to do this is what uh, is the most sensible thing to do based on engineering common sense and look here the Netherlandsky index and the relative gain seem to be suggesting the same. So, these are essentially tools to confirm conventional wisdom ok that is my take on it I, I do not think these tools have to be used it would be dis, uh, let me put it the other way it would be disastrous to not do this and recommend an input output pairing based purely on relative gain array because yeah that in my opinion would lead to is something that should not be done you use your engineering judgment and then use these metrics Netherlands key index and relative gain to confirm that what you are doing is okay okay and what you would find is 9 out of 10 times the common sense approach actually works quite well ok. Just to give you an example for example if you take a distillation column here is a distillation column a simple distillation column and do not worry if you do not understand some of the things this is just just an example reflux drum you put in some reflux back into the column take out some distillate there is some reboil you are putting in steam here that causes the vapor to boil up and then you are taking out the bottoms ok. Uh, 
let us just say this is under flow control, the feed is under flow control. Well, you have got to control two levels, liquid level at the top, liquid level at the bottom. Let us say you are doing it this way. This is probably the most common arrangement. You would also have to control the vapor pressure, the pressure of the vapor that is entrapped in the column and that the most common arrangement to do that is this. You adjust the condenser duty or the cooling rate in the condenser to control the pressure, temperature control and let us say you are adjusting the reflux to maintain a rectifying tray temperature. Now, the choice of these two tray temperatures, what you would find is if I am controlling a rectifying tray temperature using T rectifying is controlled using reflux and T stripping some tray temperature in the stripping section is controlled using uh, Q reboiler, the reboiler duty. Okay. If I am doing this, what you would find is typically my Niederlinsky index and my relative gains would be positive possibly close to 1, but certainly Niederlinsky index would not be negative. On the other hand, if you do this kind of a pairing, where you are controlling a rectifying tray temperature using reboiler duty and a stripping tray temperature using reflux, and now that does not make, make sense, right. Then what you would find is that these metrics are not well behaved. You may get a negative Niederlinsky index or, index or you may get a relative gain that is negative and therefore, these pairings are not recommended. Now, if you ask an operator for him controlling reflux, uh, controlling a rectifying tray temperature, the most obvious handle is reflux, controlling a stripping tray temperature, the most obvious handle is reboiler duty. These metrics, Netherlandsky index and relative gain, would confirm that indeed that is the way to do it. And they would also suggest, hopefully, that if you do it the other way, well, that is not the way to do it because you get a negative relative gain and or a negative Netherlandsky index. So, these are I would recommend these as tools to confirm your engineering wisdom and what the effort should be is to you know uh, do as much as possible to gather or to become wise in the engineering common sense way. Okay. Uh, there is another uh, thing that needs to be discussed here and that is called decoupling. Uh, I would call it dy dynamic decoupling and I think this will be the last thing that we do maybe one more dynamic decoupling. See, if I have a multivariable 2 by 2 system, it is most easily illustrated on a 2 by 2 system. One, two, three, four, and what I have is y 1, y 2, and this is u 1 this is u 2. Notice if I make a change here, let us say this goes up as a step. Okay. If u 1 is increased as a step, then y 1 would give a response. Let us say it gives this kind of a response. y 2 would also give a response and let us just say it is a, it gives a response. Now, I know I am changing u 1 and therefore, I know y 2 is going to show a response. What I would like is how should I adjust, adjust u 2? How should I adjust u 2? So, that this signal is the negative of this signal. All right. Then what I would get is y 2 does not show any response or very little response. Right. So, because I know I am changing u 1, therefore, I know y 2 is going to change 
can I change u 2 in such a way such that the overall effects get cancelled and y 2 does not show any response that is the question I am asking and I can I can ask the same question when I am making a step change to u 2 how should I change u 1 such that this plus this goes to 0. So, then what I will have is I change u 1 y 1 response y 2 shows, shows no response I change u 2 y 2 response y 1 shows no response this is what is called a decoupled system y 1 and y 2 are not coupled with u 1 and u 2 u 1 affects y 1 does not affect y 2 u 2 affects y 2 does not affect y 1 that is a decoupled system. So, how do we accomplish this decoupling I can use the philosophy of feedback control let me call this u 1 star and let me call this u 2 star and you can since I have drawn that circle you can think I uh, will be putting in a signal there. What I do is I take this guy multiply it by some transfer function and add it up here. Now, what should go in here that is the question. Okay. Well, what should go in here should be such that this and this are negative of each other. So, if u 1 is going up as a step y 2 will go to g 2 1 what I would like is that this signal should be minus g 2 1 for this signal to be minus g 2 1 this signal should be minus g 2 1 by g 2 2 well. So, that is what goes in here what should go in here minus g 2 1 by g 2 2. Similarly, if I give a step here I would like that only this changes this does not change y 1 does not change. In order to do that I take this signal pass it through a transfer function box and what should go in here that is the question well what should go in here should be such that this signal is the negative of this signal. Okay. If this is going up as a stop this signal will be g 1 2 times u 2. So, this signal has to be negative of that in order for this signal to be negative of that what should this be this should be minus g 1 2 by g 1 1 well that is what goes in here minus g 1 2 by g 1 1. Now, if you look at if you look at the input output relation in this box okay, if you look at the input output behavior between u 1 star and y 1 and between u 2 star and y 2 uh, if I go to the next page there will be trouble let us just see if I can fit it in here. Okay. So, let us just see how y what is the dependence of y 1 on u 1 star and u 2 star if I say if I look at. So, y 1 would be equal to g 1 1 times u 1 st star that is this guy when I make a change here this decoupler will cause a change in u 2 and this change in u 2 will give me an additional signal here. Okay. What is that additional signal that would be plus minus g 2 1 by g 2 2 that is this guy times g 1 2 into u 1 star. So, that is the dependence of y 1 on u 1 star. What is the dependence of y 1 on u 2 star? Well, if u 2 star goes up as a step the effect on y 1 would be plus g 1 2 into u 2 star. 
Now, because u 2 has gone up as a step, this decoupler will cause what I am saying is this decoupler, this, this decoupler will cause u 1 to move and what is that movement in u 1 would be minus g 1 2 over g 1 1 times g this signal is minus g 1 2 over g 1 1 multiplied by g 1 1 times u 2 star. Now, if this thing is physically realizable, what I mean is if this thing is physically realizable, then these two terms actually cancel out, right. And what I have is y 1 depends only on u 1 star, no dependence on u 2 star. Similarly, what I will find is that y 2 depends only on u 2 star, no dependence on u 1 star, all right. So, this is called dynamic decoupling and uh, I have covered it just for the heck of covering it because it is covered usually covered most of the places. Uh, the thing that I wanted to tell you was that in chemical processes set point tracking is required only when you are starting up the plant or shutting down the plant. That happens let us say once in 2 years or once in a year set point tracking. Okay. What you are interested in is load rejection most of the time load rejection is kind of like autopilot okay, in, in flying and, and just to just to make that point let us just consider this a single input single output system G P. I have got a controller uh, let us see something is coming here and what I have here is G D and this is disturbance D this is Y and what I have is Y set point plus minus that is negative feedback this is the error and this is the input to the process. Okay. So, the disturbance d affects y through the transfer function g d okay. and if I look at the closed loop I mean the overall transfer function what I will find is if d is 0 how does y set point affect a change in y set point affect y we saw that y okay let us just let us just do this y is equal to this signal plus this signal that is equal to. So, this signal is g p times u or g p g c e. So, this is actually g p g c error and the error is y set point minus y and okay and this signal is plus g d times d. Now, if I take the y terms on the left hand side what I get is 1 plus g p g c times y is equal to g p g c times y set point plus g d times d and then if I divide by what is here what I will get is this is what I get all right. So, how does y depend on a change in y set point or on a change in the disturbance d well this is the equation that governs that that shows that dependence. Okay. 
this is called the servo transfer function that we have seen this is called the servo transfer function and this is called the regulator transfer function all right so we were talking about the servo and regulator transfer function so if we have a single input single output system system with a block diagram as shown here the dependence of the output on a change in the disturbance and or a change in the set point is given by this equation and this transfer function is called the servo transfer function and this transfer function is called the regulator transfer function and the servo transfer function shows how the output responds to a change in the set point a regulator transfer function uh, characterizes how the output changes to a change in the disturbance now notice that in both the transfer functions 1 plus g p g c occurs in the denominator and this is what actually determines the stability of the closed loop system. Why am I talking about the servo and the regulator transfer function that is because when I am running a plant I am actually more interested in ensuring that disturbances are rejected effectively. So, I am interested more in the regulator response my interest in the servo uh, in the uh, in the servo response is not as much because primary objective in chemical processes load disturbance effective load disturbance is the primary function of the control system of the control system in chemical processes and what do I mean by that what I mean by that is what would constitute a load disturbance for example the quality of the feed to the process changes the quality of the feed to a distillation column changes the quality of the feed going into a process changes that is a disturbance into your process my control system should be able to handle it. Another example I would like to increase the throughput or change the throughput or change the production rate in the process. So, my heating rate, cooling rate, flow rates etcetera must follow that change in throughput ok what must effectively execute that change in throughput for me. So, that is again a load disturbance more heating load less heating load ok. So, these are so throughput changes examples of load disturbances is throughput changes or yeah throughput or feed rate changes more generally referred to as throughput changes. Another example is feed quality changes what are other load disturbances well ambient conditions disturbances we have talked about this days are hotter than nights winters are colder than summers the cooling water in rainy season is not as cold because cooling towers are not as efficient because the air is humid and so on and so forth ok. So, these are all disturbances I want to operate at a set point regardless of these disturbances and that is governed by the regulator response ok. Load disturbance is the primary function set point remains the same I would like to operate my reactor at this reaction temperature regardless of what is the composition of the feed regardless of what is the flow rate that is going going into the reactor right. So, that is actually governed by uh, regulator response. So, the regulator response is what is of interest in operating a chemical process around its design steady state ok that is point number one where is set point tracking important well aerospace systems for example their set point tracking is important because the missile has to follow a certain trajectory that trajectory is the set point the position set point that your missile should track similarly aeroplanes choppers etc robot robotic arms. So, in mechanical or and or aerospace systems set point tracking is important in chemical systems it is load rejection or load disturbance rejection effective rejection or effective handling of load disturbances is what is important. This point I would like you to keep in your mind because for example, we covered decoupling why is decoupling important well decoupling is important because if your objective is to track the set point 
and you have a decoupled system. What happens in a decoupled system is if you change input u only y 1 gets affected y 2 does not get affected. If you change input u 2 y 2 gets affected y 1 does not get affected. So, therefore, the loop for y 1 and the loop for y 2 can be tuned real tight and this loop does not disturb that loop and that loop does not disturb this loop. So, where the set point tracking is important decoupling is useful. Load disturbance rejection for load disturbance rejection you know decoupling may or may not be useful that is because the transfer function itself is different is different and in a in a papers way back in the early 70s 1971 probably Niederlinsky actually showed in a paper that if you implement a decoupler your load rejection actually becomes worse your regulator response with the regu with the decoupler in there actually becomes worse set point tracking is better off but there is there are cases where load rejection actually suffers with the decoupler in there okay so implementation of a decoupler may or may not be recommended all the while in fact if you look at what bill liven has to say he says regulate um, you know we actually do not need decoupling, okay. but nevertheless for the sake of completion I have covered it. Uh, next time what we are going to do is cover probably the last thing that needs to be covered which is uh, model predictive control. Right now what we have seen is you know you got controllers and We have looked at the PID control algorithm, we have looked at how to tune the tuning constants in a PID controller. Uh, these PID controllers for example, may not work very well for, for, for systems with difficult dynamics. What is an example of a system with diffi difficult di dynamics? For example, systems with a long red time or a system with an inverse response which is also sometimes referred to as wrong way behavior. So, what happens if you got a long dead time, the process has got a long dead time, what happens there is I have got my I have got my process and I have put in my P i controller y set point y plus minus okay i put in my pi controller i make a change here nothing happens here for a long time now because nothing is happening to the output the error remains unchanged the integrator in the uh, pi controller keeps on adjusting this guy okay and what that essentially does is you cannot have your gain too large, gain cannot be increased. If you try to increase gain to get tight control of y, what you will get start getting is sustained oscillation. Okay. So, for large dead time processes, the ultimate gain is small, it is reduced because of the large dead time and therefore, you cannot your K c your the gain that you implement in the controller also is reduced and therefore, you know the closed loop response is not as fast and snappy as you would like it to be should that be the case you would like to incorporate a model that tells the controller do nothing because the process is of that type you do something you have to wait because nothing is going to happen to the output because there is so much dead time in the process how do you do that how do you incorporate a, a model uh, to accomplish that Similarly, in an inverse response what happens is you do something here, suppose you are increasing the steam here, you expect the temperature to go up, right? but what happens is the temperature actually starts to go down before it can come up. Now, because of this wrong way behavior, again this is worse than dead time, you are, you, in the dead time nothing was happening to the output, here the output is moving in the wrong direction. Again this would cause the ultimate gain to be reduced this inverse response behavior and therefore, the gain that you can implement in your PI controller would be smaller 
and with that small gain you may or may not or and in the case where you do not get a fast and snappy acceptable closed loop response you will have to look into model based control techniques okay these model based control techniques is what we are going to come and look at next time and what i'm going to predict uh, cover next time is uh, let's see the smith predictor which is for a ciso system and then dynamic matrix control and that i believe would put an end to whatever control theory is to be uh, told or is to be covered uh, in the 9 or 10 lectures that it was supposed to be covered in thank you